Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the balancing part of the test. Uh, so here's the first question. And uh, for the balancing questions, you might wanna make a chart. So I'll demonstrate it um, over here. So basically, every time we're balancing, we're gonna compare the left side over here to the right side over here. And we're gonna see how many atoms are on each side. So I'm gonna put down our different atoms. We have our sodium. We have our calcium, we have our chlorine, and I just wanted to leave the phosphate to the last because if the phosphate is on both sides of the equation, you can keep it as a phosphate like this. So just count it as one phosphate. If, however, there's phosphate on one side and then it breaks up into the phosphorus and the oxygen on the other side, then you can't do it this way and you have to break it into separate P and separate O and count them individually. Uh, but for this one, we can't. So let's start counting. So right now we have three sodium on this side and we have one sodium on this side. We have one calcium on this side and we have three calcium on this side. We have two chlorines on this side and we have one chlorine on this side and we have one phosphate on this side and two phosphates on that side. Okay, so now that we've counted them, we can start to balance them. Remember, the only thing we can change is the coefficients, so the number in front of them. We can never change the subscripts because that's actually changing the chemical formula and it's changing what the chemical actually is. So let's, why don't we start with the sodium? We have three over here, so let's put three over here. Um, so now we can update that, and now we have three chlorine, uh, sodiums and we have three chlorines. We can't forget that this coefficient affects both this element and also this element. Um, okay, now that we've done that, why don't we look at the, it doesn't really matter, let's look at the phosphate. We have two phosphates over here, so let's put two over here to even out that. But remember that also affects the sodium. So now the sodium is at six. So I fixed it and now it's, uh, now it's broken again, but that's okay. Let's uh, look at the um, calcium right now. We have three on this side and we only have one on this side, so let's change that. So now we have three calcium, but also that changed the chlorine to six. Um, and so now what's messed up? Well, it's the chlorine and the sodium over here. So we can just fix that by adding a six right here. And so that will update it to six and six. So just to double check to make sure you're right, you can just do a little count. So we have six sodiums over here, six sodiums over here. Uh, we have two phosphates over here and two phosphates over here. We have three calciums over here and three calciums over here. And we have six chlorines over here and six chlorines over here. So we are good to go. Uh, okay, so let's do this one. Once again, we can make a little chart if we are so inclined. You can also make the charts um, on scrap peeps, pieces of paper as well. So we have P and we have O, so pretty straightforward. Uh, four P's on this side, two on this side, two O's on this side, and three O's on this side. So what can we do? Let's start off by fixing the P. So we'll put a two right here, and then that will mean we'll have two P's, or sorry, four P's, and six O's. Why did I say that we have zero O's over here? Oh boy, okay. So now we uh, are balanced on the P's, we just have to balance the O's, so that's easy enough. We'll just put a three here, and then we are good to go. So we can always double check it by just going over it again. So we have four P's on this side, four on this side, six O's on this side, and six O's on this side. Okay, so now that we've done a few, I'm not gonna do the chart anymore. Let's just see if we can uh, do them by looking at them. So we have one silicon on this side, one on this side, so that's already balanced. Um, we have two oxygens on this side and only one on this side, so we can start by putting the two in. So now our oxygens are balanced. Now look at our hydrogen. We have one hydrogen on this side and four on this side. So why don't we put a four right here? And let's look at our F situation. We have four Fs on this side and four Fs on this side. So it looks like things actually 
are pretty balanced, but when you're doing it this method without using the table, you always want to double check it again after. So we have one silicon and one silicon, two oxygens and two oxygens, four hydrogens and four hydrogens, and four fluorines and four fluorines. So we are good to go. Woohoo! Draw a little happy face for us to celebrate. Yay! I like chemistry. Um, <laughs> okay, that guy's kind of scary, actually. I don't even know why I bother with these drawings. Okay, let's uh, let's do another one. So let's do uh, this one right here. This one looks a little bit more complicated. Let's try it out again. So we have, oh yeah, one thing, when you ever have something like this and there's one lone oxygen, what are you gonna do? You're gonna save the oxygen to the very end because that will help you balance it out uh, at the very end. So we have four carbons on this side. So let's put four on this side. Um, now, hydrogen, and we're gonna remember we're gonna do oxygen at the end, so let's go to hydrogen. We have 10 hydrogens on this side, so let's put a five here to make 10 on this side. Now, oxygen, you have to be careful because oxygen is in two places. So the amount of O on this side right now will be eight times two, so that's, or sorry, four times two, which is eight, and five times one, which is five, so that we have 13 oxygens on this side. So right here, we have two oxygens on this side. So it seems like it's gonna be a little bit messy, but one trick you can do is you can say, how many times uh, does two go into 13? So basically go 13 divided by two, and that equals 7.5. So you can put 7.5 here, and wait, before you freak out and say, Mr. Primer, you can't do that, it's okay, we're not gonna end there. Uh, what we can do now is just times everything uh, by two in order to get a whole number. If you times this by two, you'll get a whole number. You'll get 13, and then so if we do that to one, we'll have to do that to everything. Because right now, this is balanced, um, if we look. So we have four carbons on this side, four carbons on this side, 10 hydrogens on this side, um, 10 hydrogens on this side. We have 13 oxygens on this side, and 13 oxygens on this side. But we can't have um, a decimal place like this, so let's times everything by two. So if you times this by two, we'll get two. If we times this by two, we'll get 13. If we times this by two, we'll get eight. And if we'll times this by two, we'll get 10. So that is the final correct answer. And I'll give this guy some green eyes and nose to make him even more happy about this. Okay, now we have the, our, on our last one here. So we have one nitrogen on this side one nitrogen on this side, uh, so that's good. And remember, let's, why don't we save this lone one till the end. We have three hydrogens on this side and two on this side. So that means we're gonna have to find a common denominator. So what do three and two both go into? They both go into six. So six divided by two is three, and six divided by three is two. So now we have six hydrogens on this side and six hydrogens on this side. So now let's check out our, um, Let's see, let's check out our nitrogens now. So because we changed this, so there's two nitrogens on this side, so let's put two on this side. Um, and now let's look at our iodines. We are six on this side and only two on this side, so let's put a three here. And I think that is good, but let's double check. So we have two nitrogens here and we have two here. We have six hydrogens here and six here. We have six iodines here and six here, so we are good. Okay, last section, you guys are doing great. Um, and like I re recommend, it's always good to stop, try to do the question on your own, and then see if you got it right or not. So here's a question, let's read it carefully. So when a log burns in a fire, the hydrocarbons in the log combine with oxygen gas in the air to produce soot and ashes and also gases. Okay, so what are the products of this reaction? So you're gonna have to uh, know what type of reaction this is. So if you have hydrocarbons, so hydrocarbons are made up of C and H, and they can have different subscripts, um, plus o oxygen gas, what are the reactants? Or sorry, what are the products? These are the reactants, what are the products? So hopefully you've been able to um, identify that this is a combustion reaction because it's producing a fire, and also because of the car, uh, hydrocarbon and oxygen. So hydrocarbon uh, and oxygen 
uh, in your combustion reactions always produce H2O and CO2. Okay, but it also gives you a hint that something else is produced. There is soot and ashes. So both of these are gases. So what would the soot and ashes be? Um, and an example that I did in class was I held a fire to a test tube. So you can see the water droplets form. Um, but it also made a kind of black soot. And the black soot is just carbon. So we call this incomplete combustion um, because it doesn't make just gases. It also makes um, a solid, which is carbon. Okay, so that these are the products of the reaction. Okay, and then kind of carrying on with that, the logs have more mass before burning than after. So basically, as they're burning, they lose mass. Does this mean that this combustion reaction does not follow the conservation of mass? Okay, so anytime you see conservation of mass, um, it's a law, so that means that it always takes place. Uh, it never doesn't take place. And this relates to our conservation of mass lab. So sometimes reactions will happen um, where you, you measure their weight and after the reaction, it weighs less. But does that mean the atoms just disappear? Does it mean that they um, stopped existing? No, it means they went to a different state. So, um, so you, what you could say here is that um, it does follow conservation of mass. Okay, uh, because um, the atoms are not destroyed. Instead, what happens to them? So when you're having a fire, you have a nice campfire, your logs slowly burn away and you're left with nothing. What's happening to the atoms in the log? They go to gas. So that's the important thing to uh, say is that the products are gases, or a lot of the products are gases, so they'll escape. They'll, they'll go away, and you're left with something that doesn't weigh as much. Um, but if you were to trap the gases um, and measure them after, if you're able to trap all the gases, it would weigh the same as before. Uh, it's just harder to trap all the gases, just like in our conservation of mass lab. Okay, last question. You guys are doing great. So Mrs. Friendly, ooh, she sounds nice, brought you in for an after-school detention. Ooh, that is rough. Uh, she had five glasses with different solutions of sodium hydroxide, sulfuric acid, vinegar, and regular water. Uh, she said that you could go uh, once, uh, you drank one that was water. Um, I think an actual teacher that did this uh, would probably um, not be a teacher for very long. They'd probably uh, get in quite a lot of trouble and maybe go to jail. Um, so I'm not going to try this out. Uh, but let's say you were in this situation. Given that uh, you had whatever laboratory materials that a high school would possess, what tests besides smell could you do to determine which one is water? So for this one, hopefully you are thinking about the acid and base lab that we were doing and you would be able to determine them with different types of indicators. And so we use quite a few different indicators throughout this uh, unit, but one of them that is so cool is cabbage juice. So we use cabbage juice to uh, determine the pH of different solutions. So this is one answer that you could provide. And so uh, if something is more acidic, like the vinegar and the sulfuric acid, it would be a pinky color. If it's something that was more basic, like sodium hydroxide, then obviously it would be uh, a, a color that's more greenish. And if it's really, really basic, like bleach, it'd be yellowish. So uh, this one that would be safe to drink would be the one uh, that looks like this right in the middle. Um, okay, so that is that question. Okay, so hopefully uh, you found that helpful and I really just encourage you to uh, go over it again uh, so that you become more comfortable with it. Go back through the video and uh, try to do the questions before um, I answer them and that will just build up your, uh, your skill at this. All right, hope that, uh, yeah, hope that you find that uh, helpful and um, I'll talk to you later.